Chapter Twenty Eight An Unfortunate Lily Maid. Of course, you must be Elaine, Anne, said Diana. I could never have the courage to float down there. Nor I, said Ruby Gillis with a shiver. I don't mind floating down when there's two or three of us in the flat and we can sit up. It's fun then. But to lie down and pretend I was dead, I just couldn't. I'd really die of fright. Of course, it would be romantic, conceded Jane Andrews. But I know I couldn't keep still. I'd be popping up every minute or so to see where I was and if I wasn't drifting too far out. And you know, Anne, that would spoil the effect. But it's so ridiculous to have a red-headed Elaine, mourned Anne. I'm not afraid to float down and I'd love to be Elaine, but it's ridiculous just the same. Ruby ought to be Elaine because she is so fair and has such lovely long golden hair. Elaine had all her bright hair streaming down, you know, and Elaine was the lily maid. Now a red-haired person cannot be a lily maid. Your complexion is just as fair as Ruby's, said Diana earnestly and your hair is ever so much darker than it used to be before you cut it. Oh, do you really think so? exclaimed Anne, flushing sensitively with delight. I've sometimes thought it was myself, but I never dared to ask anyone for fear she would tell me it wasn't. Do you think it could be called Auburn now, Diana? Yes, and I think it's real pretty, said Diana, looking admiringly at the short, silky curls that clustered over Anne's head and were held in place by a very jaunty black velvet ribbon and bow. They were standing on the bank of the pond below Orchard Slope, where a little headland fringed with birches ran out from the bank. At its tip was a small wooden platform built out into the water for the convenience of fishermen and duck hunters. Ruby and Jane were spending the midsummer afternoon with Diana, and Anne had come over to play with them. Anne and Diana had spent most of their playtime that summer on and about the pond. Idlewild was a thing of the past, Mr. Bell having ruthlessly cut down the little circle of trees in his back pasture in the spring. Anne had sat among the stumps and wept, not without an eye to the romance of it, but she was speedily consoled, for, after all, as she and Diana said, big girls of thirteen, going on fourteen, were too old for such childish amusements as playhouses and there were more fascinating sports to be found about the pond. It was splendid to fish for trout over the bridge, and the two girls learned to row themselves about in the little flat-bottomed dory Mr. Barry kept for duck shooting. It was Anne's idea that they dramatize Elaine. They had studied Tennyson's poem in school the preceding winter, the superintendent of education having prescribed it in the English course for the Prince Edward Island schools. They had analyzed and parsed it and torn it to pieces in general, until it was a wonder there was any meaning at all left in it for them, but at least the fair Lily Maid and Lancelot and Guinevere and King Arthur had become very real people to them, and Anne was devoured by secret regret that she had not been born in Camelot. Those days, she said, were so much more romantic than the present. Anne's plan was hailed with enthusiasm. The girls had discovered that if the flat were pushed off from the landing place, it would drift down with the current under the bridge, and finally strand itself on another headland lower down, which ran out at a curve in the pond. They had often gone down like this, and nothing could be more convenient for playing Elaine. "'Well, I'll be Elaine,' said Anne, yielding reluctantly, for, although she would have been delighted to play the principal character, yet her artistic sense demanded fitness for it, and this, she felt, her limitations made impossible." Ruby, you must be King Arthur, and Jane will be Guinevere, and Diana must be Lancelot. But first you must be the brothers and the father. We can't have the old dumb servitor because there isn't room for two in the flat when one is lying down. We must pall the barge all its length in blackest Samite. That old black shawl of your mother's will be just the thing, Diana." The black shawl having been procured, Anne spread it over the flat, and then lay down on the bottom, with closed eyes and hands folded over her breast. Oh, she does look really dead," whispered Ruby Gillis nervously, watching the still white little face under the flickering shadows of the birches. It makes me feel frightened, girls. Do you suppose it's really right to act like this? Mrs. Lynde says that all play acting is abominably wicked. Ruby, you shouldn't talk about Mrs. Lynde," said Anne severely. It spoils the effect because this is hundreds of years before Mrs. Lynde was born. Jane, you arrange this. It's silly for Elaine to be talking when she's dead. Jane rose to the occasion. Cloth of gold for coverlet there was none, but an old piano scarf of yellow Japanese crepe was an excellent substitute. 
A white lily was not obtainable just then, but the effect of a tall blue iris placed in one of Anne's folded hands was all that could be desired. Now she's all ready, said Jane. We must kiss her quiet brows, and Diana, you say, sister, farewell for ever, and Ruby, you say, farewell, sweet sister, both of you, as sorrowfully as you possibly can. And for goodness' sake, smile a little. You know, Elaine lay as though she smiled. That's better. Now push the flat off. The flat was accordingly pushed off, scraping roughly over an old embedded stake in the process. Diana and Jane and Ruby only waited long enough to see it caught in the current and headed for the bridge, before scampering up through the woods, across the road, and down to the lower headland where, as Lancelot and Guinevere and the King, they were to be in readiness to receive the Lily Maid. For a few minutes Anne, drifting slowly down, enjoyed the romance of her situation to the full. Then something happened not at all romantic. The flat began to leak. In a very few moments it was necessary for Elaine to scramble to her feet, pick up her cloth of gold coverlet and pall of blackest samite, and gaze blankly at a big crack in the bottom of her barge through which the water was literally pouring. That sharp stake at the landing had torn off the strip of batting nailed on the flat. Anne did not know this, but it did not take her long to realize that she was in a dangerous plight. At this rate the flat would fill and sink long before it could drift to the lower headland. Where were the oars? Left behind at the landing. Anne gave one gasping little scream which nobody ever heard. She was white to the lips, but she did not lose her self-possession. There was one chance, just one. I was horribly frightened, she told Mrs. Allen the next day and it seemed like years while the flat was drifting down to the bridge and the water rising in it every moment. I prayed, Mrs. Allen, most earnestly, but I didn't shut my eyes to pray, for I knew the only way God could save me was to let the flat float close enough to one of the bridge piles for me to climb up on it. You know the piles are just old tree trunks, and there are lots of knots and old branch stubs on them. It was proper to pray, but I had to do my part by watching out and right well I knew it. I just said, Dear God, please take the flat close to a pile and I'll do the rest, over and over again. Under such circumstances you don't think much about making a flowery prayer. But mine was answered, for the flat bumped right into a pile for a minute, and I flung the scarf and the shawl over my shoulder and scrambled up on a big providential stub. And there I was, Mrs. Allen, clinging to that slippery old pile with no way of getting up or down. It was a very unromantic position, but I didn't think about that at the time. You don't think much about romance when you have just escaped from a watery grave. I said a grateful prayer at once, and then I gave all my attention to holding on tight, for I knew I should probably have to depend on human aid to get back to dry land. The flat drifted under the bridge and then promptly sank in midstream. Ruby, Jane, and Diana, already awaiting it on the lower headland, saw it disappear before their very eyes and had not a doubt but that Anne had gone down with it. For a moment they stood still, white as sheets, frozen with horror at the tragedy. Then, shrieking at the tops of their voices, they started on a frantic run up through the woods, never pausing as they crossed the main road to glance the way of the bridge. Anne, clinging desperately to her precarious foothold, saw their flying forms and heard their shrieks. Help would soon come, but meanwhile her position was a very uncomfortable one. The minutes passed by each seeming an hour to the unfortunate Lily Maid. Why didn't somebody come? Where had the girls gone? Suppose they had fainted, one and all. Suppose nobody ever came. Suppose she grew so tired and cramped that she could hold on no longer. Anne looked at the wicked green depths below her, wavering with long, oily shadows, and shivered. Her imagination began to suggest all manner of gruesome possibilities to her. Then, just as she thought she really could not endure the ache in her arms and wrists another moment, Gilbert Blythe came rowing under the bridge in Harmon Andrews as Dory. Gilbert glanced up, and, much to his amazement, beheld a little white scornful face looking down upon him, with big, frightened, but also scornful gray eyes. "'Anne Shirley! How on earth did you get there?' he exclaimed. Without waiting for an answer he pulled close to the pile and extended his hand. There was no help for it. Anne, clinging to Gilbert Blythe's hand, scrambled down into the dory, where she sat, drabbled and furious, in the stern, 
with her arms full of dripping shawl and wet crepe. It was certainly extremely difficult to be dignified under the circumstances. "'What has happened, Anne?' asked Gilbert, taking up his oars. "'We were playing Elaine,' explained Anne frigidly, without even looking at her rescuer. "'And I had to drift down to Camelot in the barge—I mean the flat. The flat began to leak and I climbed out on the pile. The girls went for help. Will you be kind enough to row me to the landing?' Gilbert obligingly rowed to the landing, and Anne, disdaining assistance, sprang nimbly on shore. "'I'm very much obliged to you,' she said haughtily as she turned away. But Gilbert had also sprung from the boat, and now laid a detaining hand on her arm. "'Anne,' he said hurriedly, "'look here. Can't we be good friends? I'm awfully sorry I made fun of your hair that time. I didn't mean to vex you, and I only meant it for a joke.' besides it's so long ago i think your hair is awfully pretty now honest i do let's be friends for a moment anne hesitated she had an odd newly awakened consciousness under all her outraged dignity that the half shy half eager expression in gilbert's hazel eyes was something that was very good to see her heart gave a quick queer little beat but the bitterness of her old grievance promptly stiffened up her wavering determination that scene of two years before flashed back into her recollection as vividly as if it had taken place yesterday. Gilbert had called her carrots and had brought about her disgrace before the whole school. Her resentment, which to other and older people might be as laughable as its cause, was in no whit allayed and softened by time, seemingly. She hated Gilbert Blythe. She would never forgive him. No, she said coldly. I shall never be friends with you, Gilbert Blythe, and I don't want to be. All right! Gilbert sprang into his skiff with an angry color in his cheeks. I'll never ask you to be friends again, Anne Shirley. And I don't care, either! He pulled away with swift, defiant strokes, and Anne went up the steep, ferny little path under the maples. She held her head very high, but she was conscious of an odd feeling of regret. She almost wished she had answered Gilbert differently. Of course he had insulted her terribly, but still. Altogether Anne rather thought it would be a relief to sit down and have a good cry. She was really quite unstrung, for the reaction from her fright and cramped clinging was making itself felt. Halfway up the path she met Jane and Diana rushing back to the pond in a state narrowly removed from positive frenzy. They had found nobody at Orchard Slope, both Mr. and Mrs. Barry being away. Here Ruby Gillis had succumbed to hysterics, and was left to recover from them as best she might, while Jane and Diana flew through the haunted wood and across the brook to Green Gables. There they had found nobody either, for Marilla had gone to Carmody, and Matthew was making hay in the back field. "'Oh, Anne!' gasped Diana, fairly falling on the former's neck and weeping with relief and delight. "'Oh, Anne, we thought you were drowned!' And we felt like murderers because we had made you be Elaine. And Ruby is in hysterics. Oh, Anne, how did you escape? I climbed up on one of the piles, explained Anne wearily. And Gilbert Blythe came along in Mr. Andrews's dory and brought me to land. Oh, Anne, how splendid of him. Why, it's so romantic, said Jane, finding breath enough for utterance at last. Of course. You'll speak to him after this." "'Of course I won't,' flashed Anne, with a momentary return of her old spirit. "'And I don't want ever to hear the word romantic again, Jane Andrews. I'm awfully sorry you were so frightened, girls. It is all my fault. I feel sure I was born under an unlucky star. Everything I do gets me or my dearest friends into a scrape. We've gone and lost your father's flat, Diana, and I have a presentiment that we'll not be allowed to row on the pond any more. Anne's presentiment proved more trustworthy than presentiments are apt to do. Great was the consternation in the Barry and Cuthbert households when the events of the afternoon became known. "'Will you ever have any sense, Anne?' groaned Marilla. "'Oh, yes, I think I will, Marilla,' returned Anne optimistically. A good cry, indulged in the grateful solitude of the East Gable, had soothed her nerves and restored her to her wonted cheerfulness. I think my prospects of becoming sensible are brighter now than ever." "'I don't see how,' said Marilla. "'Well,' explained Anne, "'I've learned a new and valuable lesson today. Ever since I came to Green Gables I've been making mistakes, 
and each mistake has helped to cure me of some great shortcoming. The affair of the amethyst brooch cured me of meddling with things that didn't belong to me. The haunted wood mistake cured me of letting my imagination run away with me. The liniment cake mistake cured me of carelessness in cooking. Dyeing my hair cured me of vanity. I never think about my hair and nose now, at least very seldom. And today's mistake is going to cure me of being too romantic. I have come to the conclusion that it is no use trying to be romantic in Avonlea. It was probably easy enough in Towered Camelot hundreds of years ago, but romance is not appreciated now. I feel quite sure that you will soon see a great improvement in me in this respect, Marilla." "'I'm sure I hope so,' said Marilla skeptically. But Matthew, who had been sitting mutely in his corner, laid a hand on Anne's shoulder when Marilla had gone out. "'Don't give up all your romance, Anne,' he whispered shyly. "'A little of it is a good thing. Not too much, of course. But keep a little of it, Anne. Keep a little of it." Chapter 29 An Epic in Anne's Life Anne was bringing the cows home from the back pasture by way of Lover's Lane. It was a September evening, and all the gaps and clearings in the woods were brimmed up with ruby sunset light. Here and there the lane was splashed with it, but for the most part it was already quite shadowy beneath the maples and the spaces under the firs were filled with a clear violet dusk like airy wine. The winds were out in their tops, and there is no sweeter music on earth than that which the wind makes in the fir trees at evening. The cows swung placidly down the lane, and Anne followed them dreamily, repeating aloud the battle canto from Marmion, which had also been part of their English course in the preceding winter, and which Miss Stacy had made them learn off by heart and exulting in its rushing lines and the clash of spears in its imagery. When she came to the lines, the stubborn spearsmen still made good their dark, impenetrable wood, she stopped in ecstasy to shut her eyes, that she might the better fancy herself one of that heroic ring. When she opened them again, it was to behold Diana coming through the gate that led into the berry field, and looking so important that Anne instantly divined there was news to be told but betray too eager curiosity she would not. "'Isn't this evening just like a purple dream, Diana? It makes me so glad to be alive. In the mornings I always think the mornings are best, but when evening comes I think it's lovelier still.' "'It's a very fine evening,' said Diana. "'But, oh, I have such news, Anne. Guess. You can have three guesses.' "'Charlotte Gillis is going to be married in the church after all, and Mrs. Allen wants us to decorate it,' cried Anne. No, Charlotte's beau won't agree to that, because nobody has ever been married in the church yet, and he thinks it would seem too much like a funeral. It's too mean, because it would be such fun. Guess again. Jane's mother is going to let her have a birthday party? Diana shook her head, her black eyes dancing with merriment. I can't think what it can be, said Anne in despair. Unless it's that Moody Spurgeon Macpherson saw you home from prayer meeting last night, did he? I should think not, exclaimed Diana indignantly. I wouldn't be likely to boast of it if he did, the horrid creature. I knew you couldn't guess it. Mother had a letter from Aunt Josephine today, and Aunt Josephine wants you and me to go to town next Tuesday and stop with her for the exhibition. There! Oh, Diana, whispered Anne finding it necessary to lean up against a maple tree for support. Do you really mean it? But I'm afraid Marilla won't let me go. She will say that she can't encourage gadding about. That was what she said last week when Jane invited me to go with them in their double-seated buggy to the American concert at the White Sands Hotel. I wanted to go, but Marilla said I'd be better at home learning my lessons, and so would Jane. I was bitterly disappointed, Diana. I felt so heartbroken that I wouldn't say my prayers when I went to bed. But I repented of that and got up in the middle of the night and said them. I'll tell you, said Diana. We'll get Mother to ask Marilla. She'll be more likely to let you go then. And if she does, we'll have the time of our lives, Anne. I've never been to an exhibition, and it's so aggravating to hear the other girls talking about their trips. Jane and Ruby have been twice, and they're going this year again. I'm not going to think about it at all until I know whether I can go or not," said Anne resolutely. If I did and then was disappointed, it would be more than I could bear. But in case I do go, I'm very glad my new coat will be ready by that time. Marilla didn't think I needed a new coat. 
She said my old one would do very well for another winter, and that I ought to be satisfied with having a new dress. The dress is very pretty, Diana, navy blue and made so fashionably. Marilla always makes my dresses fashionably now, because she says she doesn't intend to have Matthew going to Mrs. Lynde to make them. I'm so glad. It is ever so much easier to be good if your clothes are fashionable. At least it is easier for me. I suppose it doesn't make such a difference to naturally good people. But Matthew said I must have a new coat, so Marilla bought a lovely piece of blue broadcloth, and it's being made by a real dressmaker over at Carmody. It's to be done Saturday night, and I'm trying not to imagine myself walking up the church aisle on Sunday in my new suit and cap, because I'm afraid it isn't right to imagine such things. But it just slips into my mind in spite of me. My cap is so pretty. Matthew bought it for me the day we were over at Carmody. It is one of those little blue velvet ones that are all the rage, with gold cord and tassels. Your new hat is elegant, Diana, and so becoming. When I saw you come into church last Sunday my heart swelled with pride to think you were my dearest friend. Do you suppose it's wrong for us to think so much about our clothes? Marilla says it is very sinful. But it is such an interesting subject, isn't it? Marilla agreed to let Anne go to town, and it was arranged that Mr. Barry should take the girls in on the following Tuesday. As Charlottetown was thirty miles away, and Mr. Barry wished to go and return the same day, it was necessary to make a very early start. But Anne counted it all joy, and was up before sunrise on Tuesday morning. A glance from her window assured her that the day would be fine, for the eastern sky behind the firs of the haunted wood was all silvery and cloudless. Through the gap in the trees a light was shining in the western gable of Orchard Slope, a token that Diana was also up. Anne was dressed by the time Matthew had the fire on, and had the breakfast ready when Marilla came down, but for her own part was much too excited to eat. After breakfast the jaunty new cap and jacket were donned, and Anne hastened over the brook and up through the firs to Orchard Slope. Mr. Barry and Diana were waiting for her, and they were soon on the road. It was a long drive, but Anne and Diana enjoyed every minute of it. It was delightful to rattle along over the moist roads in the early red sunlight that was creeping across the shorn harvest fields. The air was fresh and crisp, and little smoke-blue mists curled through the valleys and floated off from the hills. Sometimes the road went through woods where maples were beginning to hang out scarlet banners. Sometimes it crossed rivers on bridges that made Anne's flesh cringe with the old, half-delightful fear. Sometimes it wound along a harbor shore and passed by a little cluster of weather-gray fishing huts. Again it mounted to hills, whence a far sweep of curving upland or misty blue sky could be seen. But wherever it went there was much of interest to discuss. It was almost noon when they reached town and found their way to Beechwood. It was quite a fine old mansion, set back from the street in a seclusion of green elms and branching beeches. Miss Barry met them at the door with a twinkle in her sharp black eyes. "'So you've come to see me at last, you Anne girl,' she said. "'Mercy, child, how you have grown! You're taller than I am, I declare. And you're ever so much better looking than you used to be, too. But I dare say you know that without being told.' "'Indeed I didn't,' said Anne radiantly. "'I know I'm not so freckled as I used to be, so I've much to be thankful for. But I really hadn't dared to hope there was any other improvement. I'm so glad you think there is, Miss Barry. Miss Barry's house was furnished with great magnificence, as Anne told Marilla afterward. The two little country girls were rather abashed by the splendor of the parlor, where Miss Barry left them when she went to see about dinner. "'Isn't it just like a palace?' whispered Diana. "'I never was in Aunt Josephine's house before, and I'd no idea it was so grand. I just wish Julia Bell could see this. She puts on such airs about her mother's parlor.' "'Velvet carpet,' sighed Anne luxuriously, "'and silk curtains. I've dreamed of such things, Diana. But, you know, I don't believe I feel very comfortable with them after all. There are so many things in this room, and all so splendid, that there is no scope for imagination. That is one consolation when you are poor. There are so many more things you can imagine about. Their sojourn in town was something that Anne and Diana dated from for years.' From first to last it was crowded with delights. On Wednesday Miss Barry took them to the exhibition grounds and kept them there all day. "'It was splendid,' Anne related to Marilla later on. "'I never imagined anything so interesting. I don't really know which department was the most interesting. 
I think I liked the horses and the flowers and the fancy work best. Josie Pye took first prize for knitted lace. I was real glad she did. And I was glad that I felt glad, for it shows I'm improving, don't you think, Marilla, when I can rejoice in Josie's success? Mr. Harmon Andrews took second prize for Gravenstein apples, and Mr. Bell took first prize for a pig. Diana said she thought it was ridiculous for a Sunday school superintendent to take a prize in pigs, but I don't see why. Do you? She said she would always think of it after this when he was praying so solemnly. Clara Louise McPherson took a prize for painting, and Mrs. Lynde got first prize for homemade butter and cheese. So Avonlea was pretty well represented, wasn't it? Mrs. Lynde was there that day, and I never knew how much I really liked her until I saw her familiar face among all those strangers. There were thousands of people there, Marilla. It made me feel dreadfully insignificant. And Miss Barry took us up to the grandstand to see the horse races. Mrs. Lynde wouldn't go. She said horse racing was an abomination, and she, being a church member, thought it her bounden duty to set a good example by staying away. But there were so many there I don't believe Mrs. Lynde's absence would ever be noticed. I don't think, though, that I ought to go very often to horse races, because they are awfully fascinating. Diana got so excited that she offered to bet me ten cents that the red horse would win. I didn't believe he would, but I refused to bet, because I wanted to tell Mrs. Allen all about everything, and I felt sure it wouldn't do to tell her that. It's always wrong to do anything you can't tell the minister's wife. It's as good as an extra conscience to have a minister's wife for your friend. And I was very glad I didn't bet, because the red horse did win, and I would have lost ten cents, so you see that virtue was its own reward. We saw a man go up in a balloon. I'd love to go up in a balloon, Marilla. It would be simply thrilling. And we saw a man selling fortunes. You paid him ten cents, and a little bird picked out your fortune for you. Miss Barry gave Diana and me ten cents each to have our fortunes told. Mine was that I would marry a dark-complected man who was very wealthy, and I would go across water to live. I looked carefully at all the dark men I saw after that, but I didn't care much for any of them, and anyhow I suppose it's too early to be looking out for him yet. Oh, it was a never-to-be-forgotten day, Marilla. I was so tired I couldn't sleep at night. Miss Barry put us in the spare room, according to promise. It was an elegant room, Marilla, but somehow sleeping in a spare room isn't what I used to think it was. That's the worst of growing up, and I'm beginning to realize it. The things you wanted so much when you were a child don't seem half so wonderful to you when you get them. Thursday the girls had a drive in the park, and in the evening Miss Barry took them to a concert in the Academy of Music, where a noted prima donna was to sing. To Anne the evening was a glittering vision of delight. Oh, Marilla, it was beyond description. I was so excited I couldn't even talk, so you may know what it was like. I just sat in enraptured silence. Madame Selitsky was perfectly beautiful, and wore white satin and diamonds. But when she began to sing I never thought about anything else. Oh, I can't tell you how I felt. But it seemed to me that it could never be hard to be good any more. I felt like I do when I look up at the stars. Tears came into my eyes, but oh, they were such happy tears. I was so sorry when it was all over, and I told Miss Barry I didn't see how I was ever to return to common life again. She said she thought if we went over to the restaurant across the street and had an ice cream it might help me. That sounded so prosaic, but to my surprise I found it true. The ice cream was delicious, Marilla and it was so lovely and dissipated to be sitting there eating it at eleven o'clock at night. Diana said she believed she was born for city life. Miss Barry asked me what my opinion was, but I said I would have to think it over very seriously before I could tell her what I really thought. So I thought it over after I went to bed. That is the best time to think things out. And I came to the conclusion, Marilla, that I wasn't born for city life, and that I was glad of it. It's nice to be eating ice cream at brilliant restaurants at eleven o'clock at night once in a while, but as a regular thing I'd rather be in the East Gable at eleven, sound asleep, but kind of knowing even in my sleep that the stars were shining outside and that the wind was blowing in the firs across the brook. I told Miss Barry so at breakfast the next morning and she laughed. Miss Barry generally laughed at anything I said, even when I said the most solemn things. I don't think I liked it, Marilla, because I wasn't trying to be funny but she is a most hospitable lady and treated us royally. Friday brought going home time, and Mr. Barry drove in for the girls. Well, I hope you've enjoyed yourselves, said Miss Barry, as she bade them goodbye. Indeed we have, said Diana. And you, Anne girl? 
I've enjoyed every minute of the time, said Anne, throwing her arms impulsively about the old woman's neck and kissing her wrinkled cheek. Diana would never have dared to do such a thing, and felt rather aghast at Anne's freedom. But Miss Barry was pleased, and she stood on her veranda and watched the buggy out of sight. Then she went back into her big house with a sigh. It seemed very lonely, lacking those fresh young lives. Miss Barry was a rather selfish old lady, if truth must be told, and had never cared much for anybody but herself. She valued people only as they were of service to her or amused her. Anne had amused her, and consequently stood high in the old lady's good graces. But Miss Barry found herself thinking less about Anne's quaint speeches than of her fresh enthusiasms, her transparent emotions, her little winning ways, and the sweetness of her eyes and lips. I thought Marilla Cuthbert was an old fool when I heard she'd adopted a girl out of an orphan asylum, she said to herself. But I guess she didn't make much of a mistake after all. If I had a child like Anne in the house all the time, I'd be a better and happier woman. Anne and Diana found the drive home as pleasant as the drive in. Pleasanter, indeed, since there was the delightful consciousness of home waiting at the end of it. It was sunset when they passed through white sands and turned into the shore road. Beyond, the Avonlea hills came out darkly against the saffron sky. Behind them the moon was rising out of the sea that grew all radiant and transfigured in her light. Every little cove along the curving road was a marvel of dancing ripples. The waves broke with a soft swish on the rocks below them, and the tang of the sea was in the strong, fresh air. "'Oh, but it's good to be alive and to be going home,' breathed Anne. When she crossed the log bridge over the brook, the kitchen light of Green Gables winked her a friendly welcome back, and through the open door shone the hearth fire, sending out its warm red glow athwart the chilly autumn night. Anne ran blithely up the hill and into the kitchen, where a hot supper was waiting on the table. "'So you've got back?' said Marilla, folding up her knitting. "'Yes, and oh, it's so good to be back,' said Anne joyously. "'I could kiss everything, even to the clock. Marilla, a broiled chicken! You don't mean to say you cooked that for me?' "'Yes, I did,' said Marilla. I thought you'd be hungry after such a drive and need something real appetizing. Hurry and take off your things, and we'll have supper as soon as Matthew comes in. I'm glad you've got back, I must say. It's been fearful lonesome here without you, and I never put in four longer days." After supper Anne sat before the fire between Matthew and Marilla, and gave them a full account of her visit. "'I've had a splendid time,' she concluded happily, "'and I feel that it marks an epoch in my life but the best of it all was the coming home.